From the deserts of New Mexico to the Earth's orbit, Dr. Bernard Harris is one well-traveled Red Raider. Recently, he was in the Chancellor's Leadership class to share his story and inspire a new generation. Let's take a look. At six years old uh, was a sort of a critical event for me. Uh, my mom and dad broke up, and so they got divorced. And um, I always like to use that as sort of a, a learning opportunity uh, in that um, she left because um, of issues. And those issues uh, led her to uh, take her degree that she had from Prairie View A&M uh, as an educator and get a job uh, working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And so we actually moved out to, uh, to New Mexico and Arizona. My father, on the other hand, had about a 10th grade education. So his options were limited. And so that was probably one of the first lessons I, I learned early on is that if you're educated, you have options. If you don't, your options, not that you don't have options, but your options are, are limited. So moving out there allowed me to uh, have an extremely rewarding in environment, put me in an extremely rewarding environment. You had, you were seven when you moved out there, six yep, or seven? about seven years old. And so your mother was a teacher mm -hmm. and she's teaching on the reservation, yep. the Navajo reservation. And you're going to school there. Yep. How, how many African Americans at the school? Two. Two. Me, me and my brother. You and your brother. <laughs> That's the two. So and then were, everybody else was a Native American. Well, not exactly. So the majority were Native Americans. Uh, the way that the Bureau of Indian Affairs works, at least back on that day, is that they put these compounds in, you know, strategically around the, the nation. And, and by the way, the Navajo Nation is the largest Native American reservation out there. And so they uh, build a community, then they have government housing, and then the uh, Native American kids would come from the surrounding area for up to about 100 or so miles away to the school. And it was a boarding school. And it was the only school in that region, so we went to school alongside the Native Americans. But there were also you know, white kids and Hispanic kids that had come with their parents who were also educators. Were there any, do you remember any teachers or anything that really inspired you along the way uh, in, in high school or junior high? Well, I actually started in, in middle school in Tohatchee. You know, along the same time that I was uh, looking at television and, and uh, watching the guys go, uh, go to the moon. By the way, I should also mention that I'm a sci-fi buff, so I also uh, probably began a little bit before they got to the moon, watched Star Trek, so I'm a, I'm a big Star Trek fan. And uh, one of the reasons, and I'm sure he'll, he'll get to this, I'm going to tell you that I'm a medical doctor, one of the reasons I decided to go into medicine is because I saw uh, Bones on the Starship Enterprise, who was the first guy I saw practicing space medicine. It's kind of cool. So That's when, you, when you graduate from U of H, then you went to UTMB to get a master's? No, I actually came here. So okay. I went to Texas Tech. Okay, so you came directly yep. here to medical school. Yep, I was accepted here uh, okay. in Texas Tech and I came directly here. And uh, uh, Tech was uh, by far, I think, the, the best choice that I, that I had. It was, uh, was wonderful. I had applied to Baylor and applied to UTMB and, and uh, to UTSA and, and Tech said yes and uh, I came to West Texas. And, and tell us a little about when you were living here and you were going to medical school. Well, it's no secret that West Texas is in the heart of West Texas. There are not a lot of minorities here. And so I spent a, a lot of time, you know, both as a medical student and also as a regent, trying to encourage young people to come here from all the et ethnic backgrounds. And um, I think it's important. Why? Because I believe that this institution is the reason why I got a chance to, you know, of course, go to medical school, but got a chance to fly on a couple of missions. Uh, well, it really gave me the foundation that I needed. And I, and I want to make sure that uh, students from wherever uh, can, you know, come here and understand. And have and what a same great, opportunity. Exactly. Same opportunity and realize what a great environment this is. There's one, one story I, I'll share with you. It's, it's when I went to the Mayo Clinic, uh, I had been focused through college and focused through medical school just to get through, you know, just the hard work. You, know, you guys know about that. You know that uh, especially if you, you're going to medical school, you, you're taking these science courses um, that not many people do on, on the campus. 
you get into medical school and your whole focus is to make sure you pass so you can get out on time and, and become a doctor. So I had kind of put, pushed that aside, besides the occasional stopping studying to watch Star Trek. Uh, other than that, I was focused. When I got to Mayo, my first rotation was with Dr. Coombs. Dr. Coombs is, uh, was notable for being one of the first physicians that was sent uh, from Mayo to NASA to pull the astronauts off, you know, out of the um, out of the capsules when they landed, when they came back, and actually did, um, you know, examine them and made sure that they were okay. So we were sitting around during um, lunch, and uh, he went around the table asking, you know, what what do you want to do after you're done with your residency? And I said, I want to work for NASA, and we ended up with that kinship, and from that kinship. He uh, told me, shared with me those stories, and you could probably see I, I was getting excited. And then he introduced me to the head of the aerospace medical group there at Mayo, who's always been involved with NASA. And I kid you not, guys, I went to this guy's office. I was sitting across the table from him. After he asked me, interrogated me about why I wanted to be an astronaut and why I wanted to work at NASA, and I guess I convinced him that I really wanted to do this. This just wasn't a pipe dream. He f turned his chair around, picked up the phone behind him, and called the head of NASA and said, I have this kid who wants to become an astronaut. Tell me what should he do? And it was based on that conversation and that plan that he talked about, you know, getting involved in research, or going and working at NASA, that I sat out on that got me to NASA. Let's talk a little about the, the mission when you went up. T t tell them a little about the, you know, uh, about the blast off and, and uh, being in space. On my second flight, I got to do something very few astronauts got to do. I got to don this suit. We call it an EVA suit, extravehicular activity suit. And I, it's that white suit that you see as practice underwater and, and then also see as in space. I opened up the hatch and I walked out for the very first time and it was just incredible, the view. You've got the Earth, us moving by the Earth pretty quickly, 17,500 miles an hour. You've got this sensation that since you're outside of the vehicle that somehow gravity is going to pull you down, that you're falling. So once you got through that, we were able to do, do our tasks. Now we had all sorts of scientific experiments and things. We deployed a satellite on that spacewalk. It was incredible. But you know what my number one task was when I went out? Was to get a picture for Texas Tech. Can I tell that story? Yes. I don't know if you've right. heard this story. So after we had completed all our tasks, there's a robotic arm that's able to be lifted up about 35 feet above the payload, payload bay. And so if you could imagine, uh, we've got one of us that has our feet in the foot restraint. It was my buddy. Michael Fold, and I was just loose next to him, tethered by two tethers, one on this side and one on the other side, tethered to him. He is connected to the robotic arm and then tethered to the robotic arm because we don't want to get away from, uh, don't want to get lost in space. So I had this bright idea. I'll give you the camera. I want to do something for my alma mater, and I want to do guns up. Of course, he's from London. He'd go, what's guns up? I said, it's this. All right? He says, okay. And so he got the camera position. You imagine a bulky suit. Here's a camera. And he's got me in the viewfinder. And he says, Bernard, you're too close. I said, OK, too close. So I was about two feet away from him. So I pushed off just a little bit. So I'm floating about four feet from him. He said, Bernard, you're still too close. I can't get you. I said, OK. So I said, I have this bright idea. I'm tethered to you. Why don't I push off from you? And when I get to the end of my tether, I'm going to do guns up and then you take the picture. So that's what we did. And we had to be real quiet because there are hundreds of folks listening to our chatter. They're trying to, what the hell are these guys doing? <laughs> so I pushed off. I got to the end of the tether. I did guns up, and I actually went head over heels, you know, kind of flipped up, and he said, I missed the shot. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, OK, we got to do it. We did it three times. On the third time, we got it perfect. And I don't know if you got a chance to see that that picture, but he pushed me off. I went out to the end and I held up guns up. And behind me is the earth and space. 
Dr. Harris is another great example of how far an education from tech can take you. And I'm not sure anyone will be able to outdo getting your guns up in orbit. When Inside Texas Tech returns, we see how social networking doesn't have to be a distraction in the classroom, plus a look at how the Texas Tech system is investing $2 million in public artwork. Don't go anywhere. Inside Texas Tech coming back.